questions concern fungus and avoiding that with the adros. Do you have any methods of cultivation, particularly given in your cool climate? Um, it's, it's the nightmare of trying to cultivate these plants, isn't it? Um, the approach ought to be to take action before it happens. And you can do that by being meticulous with the cleanliness of the plants. Uh, by that I mean take dead leaves off and um, even more extreme than that, come um, here in the UK, come October as our winter approaches, I go through tray by tray all the plants, removing the dead leaves and also taking flower spikes off, even if they haven't finished flowering. You know, cut them off with a, a good a clean cut so that they can dry out before the vents on the greenhouses have to be shut up and the humidity goes right up to 100%. And that way you can avoid a lot of the problems. Uh, but even so, every year I, I do have casualties amongst the atromiscus. Uh, it's difficult to, to avoid. Uh, another question here. Um, there's a question. Do you water your adromiscuses from the bottom or from the top? <laughs> um, yes, there's a difference between what's best and what you've actually practically got time to do. Of course. <laughs> um, if you've got a lot of plants, um, you've got to be a pretty good engineer to um, sort out a method of sort of flooding trays and draining trays. Some people achieve it, and I have no doubt that is the best way to cultivate um, plants in pots. Um, but me, I, I just uh, top water with a small watering can, and it makes you look at closely at each plant individually, and you spot these developing problems. Uh, but it does take um, still quite a long time to go around them all, and you have to be careful that um, as the years go by and the rootstock grows, they might push all the sort of soil out of the top of the pot and there's just no way for it to catch any water. So you have to revisit the same pot with a watering can more than once. But I do top water my plants and uh, let they survive. Do you recommend adding decomposed granite to the soil mix? Uh, yes, but I would recommend any grit like that. Um, we can get here in the UK uh, a lovely sort of quartzy, um, uh, it's, it's called Cornish grit. It's basically a byproduct of the China clay industry uh, where they're digging up granite and uh, washing it to get the white clay out, uh, but the leftover quartz grit is, is, is wonderful. It's just like the sort of grit you find in South Africa in places. Um, so um, the, a quartz grit um, can be a good component of a compost, but it just opens it up like any other um, grit. It doesn't have any chemical uh, properties that um, aid the adromiscus, as far as I know. Is there a better time of year to repot adromiscus? Um, well, I guess um, you, you've got to, <laughs> the best thing to do is to repot them. They do like being repotted. And if you're short of time, then just get on and do it whenever you can. But it's clearly a bad idea to do it in the depths of the Northern Hemisphere uh, winter, uh, if you're a long way away from the equator because roots will get damaged and you could potentially um, end up with rot in the plant. So the ideal time would be spring when there's warmer temperatures coming up and that comment applies to virtually all succulents, I think, um, and cacti. Uh, what are some ways that you can tell uh, potentially wild collected adromiscus from a cultivated one if you're looking at uh, purchasing them? Um, I would actually say for Atromiscus, you can't. Um, and indeed, all of our plants, of course, have come from the wild, but one would like to think they've come the slow way, just as a single leaf, and that the plant itself was left there in habitat. Um, 
of course, this is a burning topic for us in the hobby now. Uh, for other succulents, particularly the cordisiform succulents, you can tell because uh, this is going off topic, of course, but I'll, I'll say it because it's so important. You, plants that have been cultivated will all look the same of each other and have a nice round cordex to them. Plants dug up in the wild will be odd shapes where they've been wedged in between different rocks. And if they're uh, particularly old specimens, you really do have to be um, careful because how many nurseries can afford to grow a plant 10, 20, 30 years before they sell it? And of course the answer is zero. It's just not uh, economic sense. So please don't ever buy a plant if you suspect it's been dug up from the wild. Um, that's it, that's the lecture. <laughs> well, thank you for that. We on the Conservation Committee are very, very much want to get that word out. Gary, I have a question for you. Um, it looks like some of the species could have some cold herniness. I was looking at Philipsae and Cooperi and uh, um, Subviridus and Subdisticus. Do you know if any of them have been tried outdoors in cold climates? Um, I don't take that risk. <laughs> I want to keep my plants alive. Um, Philipsae, I, I'll definitely cross off your list. Okay. Um, although it's a bit high altitude, it's um, further north where it's pretty warm. So, um, not much chance for that one. Um, I've heard um, anecdotally that things like coopery can take a bit of frost if it's dry. Mm -hmm. um, it would be worth trying with um, duplicates, but I would always keep a, a backup sample in um, a frost-free environment. And I don't think they'll take much in the way of frost. So it's probably a negative answer, really. There's other succulents that'll um, survive better. But you may get away with it for several years, of course. This sort of thing is so variable. Derek, there was a question on the other end about the heat succulent these succulents can take. For atros, say in Tucson, would you recommend bringing them in from the heat during the heat of the summer? Uh, this is uh, sort of very alien conditions to what I have to put up with. Um, <laughs> You certainly can scorch Andromiscus leaves and you get that nasty effect where sort of the top half of the leaf is dried up but the bottom half of the leaf is turgid and you know, stays around for several more years. Um, so the, the, what needs to be done there is to provide shading with the very quick transition we have from winter to summer as you get a, further away from the equator. Um, you know, in South Africa, it's a much slower transition from weather that's not so cold to weather that's not so hot. Um, I don't think it's so much a question of pure heat, but if you can shade succulents in Tucson and these really dry uh, conditions, I, I think um, the heat probably won't bother them too much because they'll get accustomed to it fairly slowly. Uh, you, you might be able to answer the question better than I. I don't know. Okay. Hey, Jackson. There is a kind of longish question by John Traeger about uh -huh. halfway down. Could you, could you read that for him, please? Yep. Um, he says that he is struck by the convergence in the shrub habit of Adramiscus maximus with Tylocotin wallichii. Uh, likewise, the red pith of some of the adro stems uh, can also be observed in the cut stems of tylocodons, like paniculatus. Have you noticed these similarities, um, and might you have any insights as to their significance, if any? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think the quick answer is no. Um, I had noticed it in paniculatus, but not to the same degree. I think you get a ring of redness um, around the the core of the plant, um, but I, I've no idea what that resin, is, the function of it is. Uh, we need a proper sort of biologist to investigate this. Um, still more questions, of course, but, but thank you, John. That's interesting information. There's okay. another question here um, concerning pot size for adromiscuses. 
Um, he says that most of your photos are shown in about three inch diameter pots. Uh, is there an advantage to keeping the plants in smaller pots? Um, and is it a problem? Uh, the excess dirt maybe, you plant them in larger pots. Uh, uh, now this one is a question of uh, do as I say and don't do as I do. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sh short of space, of course, for growing plants. Um, so my atromiscus have to put up with very, very tight pots. But I, I think that probably true of the situations where the vast majority of them grow. Uh, they grow in sort of cracks in the rocks where there isn't much uh, in the way of um, soil and debris and detritus there for them to, to feed off. So definitely keep the pots on the tight side for the plants, but maybe not as tight as um, some of my poor specimens have to put up with. And if you certainly want to grow them more quickly, then pop them into larger pots and they do respond quite nicely. Uh, I'll mention here a little trick though. Um, sometimes you get a plant, um, this applies to many succulents, which has got quite a lot of top growth to it, but when you tip it out of the pot, you don't find much in the way of roots underneath. Um, so you feel you want to put it into a bigger pot, just uh, sort of artistic reasons, to balance the shape of the plant. Now, one, something you can do there is to bury into the compost chunks of polystyrene. Um, that has the advantage of reducing the weight of things, but it's all about reducing the water retention capacity of the pot. So it's not improving the drainage at all. So you want quite a bit of compost between the lumps of polystyrene. But uh, it does mean that the bigger pot will still dry out plant as if it was a smaller pot, which is very useful. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, give it a try. It works very nicely. Um, this is kind of an interesting question here. Um, when you gr grow the plants in cultivation, um, the question asked specifically with seed, um, do they develop the same leaf characteristics and patterns that they exhibit in the wild? Well, um, everything gets mixed up again, of course, as you uh, combine the DNA um, through the process of sex in the plants. Um, so you'll get a great variation um, in the first generation, reflecting the variation of the um, parent population, you know, not just the individuals that you use. Um, so um, it's very unpredictable and very rewarding to grow Adromiscus from seed. You never know quite what a, a treasure might uh, pop up. Somebody was asking about, uh, <clears throat> about your previous book and wh whether or not there's a time uh, the timing for your new book. Do you have a new book uh, close to ready or how long should we wait? I'm afraid it's all up here at the moment. So we're talking of a time scale of years and I strongly suspect that uh, by the time I get there, um, publishing books might be something of the past and it'll have to be something on the internet. But I, I meant to mention but forgot that um, our book with um, John Pilbeam and Chris Rogerson is available as a free download now. Um, not that permission was ever given for that, but you can get it off the internet if you Google us as the authors. Uh, you should be able to find it. Uh, Notice that we didn't we didn't mention that. I'm, I'm glad you brought, brought it up though. I think I'm entitled to, but uh, since it breaks the copyright, uh, other people shouldn't. Once again, before I forget, maybe there will be one, one or more questions uh, in a second here, but I want to thank you once again for the wonderful presentation today. Uh, we'll keep this on the Facebook page for until the end of uh, uh, the weekend here, and then we'll take it down. So if you want to, if you missed the beginning of it, or if you want to review part of it, uh, now would be a good time to do that here. Uh, before we go, are any, any last questions or any last thoughts? Erwin, Jackson, Rod, anybody? I just saw one more question come in um, asking about the dormancy. Um, if adromiscuses go through a dormancy and how you should treat them um, during that dormant period. Yes, I guess they do have a dormancy, but it's really 
just a period when they're not growing, which would be a majority of the year. Um, so the cycle would be that in autumn they grow or they start growing new leaves, sometimes not till the following spring. Uh, then they switch over to growing the flower spike and then they just sit around for a while whilst the seed ripens. Um, so you know, there's no sort of obvious dormancy with these leaf succulents. It's not like a cordisiform plant. Um, so maybe that's not quite the right term to, um, to use, but they're just periods when they don't need as much water. Okay, someone asked plastic or clay pots. I think that depends on where you're at. Oh, yes. Um, I think it's a good question because there is a role for clay pots um, in our hobby. Uh, of course, um, they've nearly all been replaced by plastic, but uh, I keep the uh, most difficult of species in clay pots. And in Adromiscus terms, that means Adromiscus nanus. Uh, I've got some of those in a clay pot because the clay will dry out in less than half the time of a plastic pot. Um, so if you actually grow them all mixed together, you can water them all at once and know that uh, the ones in the clay won't uh, collapse on you for <laughs> overwatering. Um, so yes, there is a role. Um, and in cactus terms, for instance, Astrophyta mysterious. Um, that's the only way I keep that alive in a, in a clay pot rather than a plastic. We have uh, quite a few questions. Everyone's saying thank you very much for a very interesting talk, of course, and we'll keep this thing online for, for the weekend here. And uh, people are saying they're glad to see you. And we're always, we're, uh, this is our first time. Maybe you can join us back uh, at some future time and we'll do, we'll do uh, maybe another talk. And uh, everyone else, Al Jackson, Urban, anyone else have something to contribute before we say goodbye? Just thanks Please. very much. It was yes, thank you very That's much. It. Okay, Derek, uh, we will see you. Everyone else, please join us in, in, in two weeks or so, and, uh, and we'll, we'll do this again. All right, everyone, I'm going to looking sign forward. off here, and uh, we'll, we're looking forward to seeing you in two weeks. Once again, Derek, thank you so much. Bye. Yeah. Bye, Bye